Namaste. So here we're going to go into the final section of the introduction to chapter three of Canto Four of Brihadar and Yakupanishad. <laughs> These are like an ocean of shlokas and comments on the Brahman that is just so full of nectar. I mean, I feel like a fish swimming and playing and splashing in this huge ocean. It's never ending. I mean, I can't discover any boundaries to this knowledge. But it just goes on and on and delivers. You know, if you really get into it, it delivers this transcendental bliss. And I have to say the quality of my life and consciousness has improved so much since studying the Upanishads directly, not through anybody else's comments, not through anybody's interpretation, but directly, you know, straight to the source. And especially Shankaracharya's interpretation is really the best. I mean, there's nobody else who gives such light and such deep insight into the Upanishads. So let's take up from where we left off last time. And if you haven't read it or you haven't downloaded it, you should download the text, which is linked in the video description, and follow along with our commentary. He who is called Inda, Vaishwanara, takes fine food. Beyond it, in the heart, is the self identified with the subtle body, which takes finer food, that's taijasa, or svapna consciousness. Higher still is the self identified with the universe, which has the vital force for its limiting adjunct, that is, the pragna. So, these are the three states of conditioned consciousness. Jagrat, consciousness of the senses and the world. Svapna, consciousness of the mind and dreams. And Sushupti, or Pragna, which is really hard to describe. <laughs> but it's like the primal source. It's like... Like he says, it's identified with the universe, the whole universe, and the vital force. So these entities are inferred. We went over this the last time. By inferential logic, from the symptoms of the states of consciousness that we all experience every single day. So when one realizes these states of consciousness one also becomes identified with these higher selves. People talk about the higher self all the time, but they never define it. Well, here it is defined very clearly. It is the collective, the aggregate, or the personification of the whole of these states of consciousness within the entire universe. So this is the higher self, and the higher self is within all of us, and we all have access to it all the time. But we never do. Why? It's because we're identified with the world, with the body, with the senses, with the mind, with all of these abstractions like identity and personality and positions and labels and interactions and deals and all this stuff that we create out of words like a house of cards built up to the sky. Maybe it'd be better to call it the Tower of Babel. <laughs> because that's what it is. And as soon as we realize the abstract and insubstantial nature of these mental constructions, the whole structure comes tumbling down, like Jenga. Huh? You pull out the wrong block and kaboom, the whole thing crumbles. <laughs> So, 
Once we get to that stage, we see beyond the trivial abstractions, designations, labels, and names and forms of this world to the states of consciousness that reveal the world, both gross and subtle. And even beyond that, to the causal nature, the causal ocean, the ocean of milk. Huh? That's pragna. Pragna means the first knowledge or the highest knowledge. And this is the creative force that we use to create ourself, our bodies, and the worlds in which we live. So then Shankara goes on. By dissolving in the Supreme Self through knowledge, even this self identified with the universe, which is but a limiting adjunct, like the snake, for instance, in the rope, the transcendent Brahman referred to in the passage, this self is that which has been described as not this, not this, has been inculcated. Whoa. Not only is it a run-on sentence, it's a tangly mess. I call it spaghetti syntax. <laughs> because this English translation comes from the Sanskrit original. And in Sanskrit, word order is not important at all. You have to figure out the grammatical connections between the words because the text is adjusted to fit the poetic meter. So because of that, sometimes these slokas become all tangled up when translated into English. I've rewritten this long sentence in, I hope, <laughs> a form that more properly respects the English usage. Well, let's try reading it again and see if it makes more sense. The transcendent Brahman referred to in the passage, this self is that which has been described as not this, not this, in the verse quoted above, has been inculcated, taught by persistent instruction, by dissolving even this self identified with the universe, Vaishvanara or Hiranyagarbha, which is but a limiting adjunct, in the Supreme Self through knowledge, like, for instance, dissolving the snake into the rope. Well, I hope that makes it clearer. <laughs> so what is he actually saying here in this convoluted and, <laughs> and all twisted and jumbled together way? Well, he's saying that the method of realizing Brahman is to dissolve the limiting adjuncts, the upadis, into Brahman, which is the source from which they come. Just like in the example of the rope and the snake. How do we get rid of the snake? Well, we gain knowledge of the rope. As soon as we know, oh, this is actually a rope, the snake simply dissolves because it was never real to begin with. In the same way, these three states of conditioned consciousness, as soon as we know that their source, their substrate, their ground of being is Brahman, and that they are simply projections, overlays, or superimpositions on Brahman, as soon as we understand this fact, they all dissolve. And along with the states of consciousness, the world that they reveal or that they describe dissolves as well. We don't see the world anymore as the world. If we see the world, if the world remains visible to us at all because of connection with the body, we understand that it's a projection. It's like the snake. It's imaginary. It's illusory. It's temporary. Because the knowledge of Brahman dissolves the idea that the world is real. 
just like the knowledge of the, of the rope dissolves the snake. Until that happens, the snake and the world appear real to us, and they cause real impacts, real reactions. The fear by seeing the snake is real, even if the snake itself is false. But as soon as we know, oh, actually this is a rope, that fear dissipates. All the affects, emotional changes and impacts of the illusion fade away. And the same is true of the conditioned consciousness and Brahman. That is why in the next sentence, Shankara says, Thus did Yagyavalkya set Janaka beyond fear by a brief reference to scriptural evidence. In other words, just by quoting that one shloka, that one mantra, that one Upanishadic phrase, he took Janaka out of the material consciousness and revealed to him the Brahman that is the actual reality. And because the conditioned states of consciousness give rise to fear and other emotional affects, which are not at all pleasant, they also dissolve upon realizing the actual reality. Just like if we dream, for example, at night of being chased by a tiger or another dangerous animal or whatever, the fear that we feel is real. But once we wake up and we see, oh, actually that was just a dream, the fear dissipates. Similarly, once we know that Brahman, beginningless, endless, indestructible, all-knowing, all full of energies and qualities and beauties and wisdom, strength, power, eternity, knowledge, consciousness, bliss, and so on, is the reality, then all the emotional and other impacts of these upadis, even up to and including the upadi of God, like he says here, these coverings, Vaishvanara, Taijasa, and Pragna, of the three states of consciousness, Jagrat, Svapna, and Sushupti, respectively, are simply limiting adjuncts, upadis, covering the reality, which is Brahman. So as soon as we know Brahman, then these upadis can't cover it anymore, and all of their effects go away. This is liberation. This is bliss. This is enlightenment. This is the object or the aim or the purpose of the whole Vedas. Here, meaning in the quote above from Brihadaranyaka 421, in a different connection to show the order of gradual emancipation, the states of wakefulness, jagrat, dream, svapna, profound, profound sleep, sushupti, and transcendence, turiya, have been introduced in the words, inda, has finer food, the different vital forces, and this self is that which has been described as not this not this. In other words, that long shloka that we quoted right in the beginning of this has in it embedded the knowledge, the wisdom that reveals Brahman. And what is that? That these states of conditioned consciousness are only steps leading to the realization of Brahman. That is the way to look at them. That is the way to conceive of them. 
in such a way that they do not bind us, they do not condition us, but they actually show us the way to freedom. Then he says, now, in this chapter, the subject is to be explained at length through those very states of wakefulness, etc., with the help of valid reasoning. In other words, now we're going to explain Jagrat, Svapna, and Sushupti in terms of reasoning rather than in terms of their aggregates or their universal oceans, uh, their reservoirs in the universal creation. Because even though that knowledge is helpful, it doesn't lead us directly to liberation. Whereas being able to reason with valid reasoning, what does he mean valid reasoning? That logic which leads to the same or similar conclusions as the Vedas themselves. Any reasoning that leads in any other direction or to any other conclusion is invalid reasoning. And of course, there are many examples of that. <laughs> Just try to read any of these modern studies or papers on consciousness, and you'll see they come up with all kinds of weird conclusions because they're based on the assumption that consciousness has a material cause. In other words, consciousness is a symptom of Jagrat, Vaishvanara, the aggregate of material consciousness, but it's not. It can't be, because consciousness is transcendental. It's causeless. You can never find the cause of something that's causeless, that's absolute. The absolute is that which has no cause, but is the cause of everything else. Consciousness is so fundamental that it becomes an assumption in everything that we think feel, and say. For example, if I say, oh, the box is on the table over there. I have a, a box where I keep odds and ends on my living room table. If I say the box is on the table, that assumes the statement, I am conscious that the box is on the table. If I was not conscious of the box being on the table, how could I say anything about it? Or anything that I did say about it would simply be fictitious, useless. So the point is that within our language, within our thinking, within our very perceptions is the assumption, the unstated assumption, but the universal assumption that I am conscious of this. Because without consciousness, there isn't anything. So then he says, Janaka is to be helped to attain the Brahman that is beyond fear. The existence of the self should be established by the removal of the doubts raised against it. And it should be proved to be different from the body, pure, self-effulgent, by nature identical with constant intelligence and superlative bliss, and beyond duality. Well, this is a very nice description of Brahman. Anyone who realizes Brahman is beyond fear, because the greatest fear is the fear of death, isn't it? If we put Jagrat first, if we think that Jagrat is the only arena of consciousness that really matters, then we are going to be in fear and trembling constantly. Because in Jagrat, everything is temporary. Everything is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. So in order for something to be not only permanent, but satisfactory, satisfying, blissful, 
bringing happiness and peace and the end of fear. It has to be eternal. It has to be permanent. And that is only the self. So everything in this Jagrat world is impermanent, <laughs> unsatisfactory or imperfect and not self. So therefore, our experience in Jagrat is permeated by constant fear. Fear of death, fear of loss, fear of making a mistake, fear of ignorance, fear of, I mean, so many fears on and on and on. But the biggest one is the fear of death. That is the formless, uncaused, uh, groundless anxiety that permeates everyone's consciousness in this world as long as they believe this world is real. But since we have to die, and we all have to die, we have to find a platform of existence beyond death. Everybody talks about, you know, after death states, stuff like this. But what is the platform for that? What is the state of consciousness once the body and the senses are finished? Once there's no more connection with the world of three dimensions and time, then how do we exist? See, nobody knows these things. But this is all discussed here in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, with all deep logical reasoning as to cause, effect, the various developments and the different stages of consciousness, and on and on and on. And you'll see, uh, if you go and read ahead, you'll see <laughs> how this is all explained in such wonderful deep detail. In just one chapter of this huge manga, Upanishad, the Brihad Aranyaka. Now, Brihad means great or greatest. And Aranyaka, as we talked about recently in our video on the structure of the Vedic literature, the Aranyakas are confidential Vedic literatures that can only or should only be taught directly by a guru, a realized guru, in a setting of complete renunciation and austerity in the forests. That's what Aranya means. So Brihat Aranya Ka in the forest, Upanishad. Upanishad means the external meaning is come here, sit down and listen. <laughs> the internal meaning is this is a secret teaching. Why is it secret? Because it completely demolishes every other understanding and every other literature and every other form of human understanding in the world. Once you know this, you're not any more fit to exist in this world. That's why once you understand this, you get liberation. That's the purpose of the Upanishads. And that's the purpose of this chapter we're going to be studying. So he finally comes out and says, for this purpose, the present section is introduced. The story is meant to indicate the method of imparting and receiving the instruction, Upanishad, and is particularly a eulogy on knowledge, as is suggested by the granting of the boon, etc. So this is the purpose of this whole section of Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. That by hearing this, Upanishad, come here, sit down, listen to this confidential, powerful, liberating teaching, that you will be freed from all fear. You will attain liberation. You will get self-realization. You will get knowledge and the wisdom that leads beyond this world to complete mastery of all states of consciousness, which is freedom, We're no longer conditioned by any causes. We are beyond all that. 
once we understand, once we realize Brahman. And this is the path. The, these are the stages and the methods that lead to that realization. And uh, just one last thing. Not only the method of imparting and receiving the instruction, but a eulogy on knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Knowledge is what unlocks the door to freedom, as is suggested by the granting of the boon. Yajnavalka had given Janaka a boon in a previous chapter that you can ask me any question you like. So now Janaka is taking advantage and he's going to ask question after question after question and lead Yajnavalkya to impart the best of his knowledge, the greatest of his wisdom and leading Janaka to full self-realization that even though he's a king, I mean, he was really a great king, a great emperor with so many responsibilities and so many possessions and relationships in this world. Still, he could rise above all that. He could realize the Brahman that is behind all the illusions of the existence of the world. He could transcend all the attachments and all the designations and relations and so on and attain that which is, like he says here, different from the body, pure, self-effulgent, by nature identical with constant intelligence and superlative bliss and beyond duality. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>